Hi, my name is Greg Slepak, and I'm here to deconfuse some of the confusion surrounding the word decentralization. Many of you have probably seen this graphic before. It comes from a 1964 paper written by Paul Barron, and he was using it to describe some of the properties of network topologies. What many people miss, however, is that it was written in a time before the internet actually existed. And that's somewhat unfortunate because the word decentralized is thrown in there along this spectrum that only pays attention to network topologies. It doesn't actually pay attention to how the word decentralization is often used to refer to power. In fact, the term decentralization predates the paper by over a century when it was used to refer to decentralizing French political power structures. In the picture on the left, we see the centralized network with a single point of failure, and it becomes decentralized, removing points of failure. Uh, on the right, we have a network that he referred to as distributed, and he used that to refer to a network that, should any one node go down, it doesn't take the entire system down. Now, again, this has caused some confusion because it's placed these words on a spectrum and when they're just words that refer to different aspects of a system. So Paige Peterson and Peter Todd tried to improve upon it uh, earlier this year, and they created this graphic. You can see in the two columns on the right, the decentralized and distributed networks of Paul's were, are actually in both pictures, but the only difference between the two uh, columns is that in one there is a hand that it indicates that the system belongs to a single party, and in the other one uh, the hand isn't there. This is better, but it's still a little bit problematic in the sense that it places the words along a spectrum. And that can still mislead people into thinking that, you know, one side uh, is bad and the other side is good. So how do we use these terms today to describe systems? When we say the system is distributed, we mean that it decentralizes the location of some resource, but not necessarily the control over that resource. And when we talk about decentralized systems, we are talking about systems that distribute the control over that resource by removing central points of failure. These words can also be used to refer to parts within a system, so it's perfectly plausible to have a system that has components that are centralized, distributed, uh, and decentralized. If we look at some concrete examples of systems, we can see that Napster was an example of a system that was distributed because it distributed music across many different peers. However, it was centralized because those peers had to connect to a single point of failure, the Napster server, to coordinate the peers. Later on, BitTorrent came along to try and address that problem. It decentralized the system by making there not be a single coordinating server. PayPal and Amazon represent systems that are distributed in that they distribute data and processes over a global network of machines, but they're centralized in that peers have to transact through a single website controlled by a single company. Ethereum and Bitcoin are systems that are distributed and decentralized, uh, except, you know, maybe in the case of Vitalik as being a single point of failure. Hopefully not. Blockchains can start decentralized, but they don't always necessarily end up that way. So it's important to be able to quantify the decentralization of a system. And in the case of blockchains, we can come up with a metric. And we can say that the decentralization of a blockchain is just the number of doors that need to be knocked on to compromise the system. Or in other words, the minimum of the number of developers who have control over the code, the number of nodes supporting the network, and the number of miners and validators who are securing the network. If we graph it over time, we see that there is a start where the number is low because there's just Satoshi hacking away, and it progresses until a peak where the limiting factor is the number of developers. There are a whole bunch of nodes. But then suddenly mining pools form, and now uh, mining pools are the limiting factor, and we get all the way down to one at one point in time when Ghash had uh, over 51% of the power. If we compare Bitcoin's decentralization to Ethereum's to PayPal's, we can look at statistics on mining pools today and see that there are about two or three pools that combined have over 51% of the hash rate, and that's about the number of pools you'd have to coerce in order to compromise the system. Same goes for Ethereum. In the case of Bitcoin XT, we have an example of a system where the development structure is such that there's a benevolent dictator, so there's only one person that you would need to coerce to insert a backdoor into the system to compromise it. And the same applies to PayPal. Now, I can't overemphasize the significance of this, because decentralization is the only thing distinguishing blockchains from the databases of old. All of the stuff that we love about blockchains goes out the window uh, if the blockchain centralizes. Uh, a smart contract isn't very useful if its operation can be censored due to a 51% attack. Uh, you might as well have written a faster version of it on Amazon Web Services. So remember, without decentralization, 
Ethereum amounts to an inefficient version of Amazon Web Services. Thank you so much for having me today. Uh, here's my contact information if you want to get in touch. Please enjoy the rest of DEF CON.